So, <laughs> Acts chapter 12, the last couple of weeks we looked at uh, essentially, we did two teachings uh, reflecting on lessons from Peter in uh, basically going through deliverance and being set free. And so we looked at about five different things that we got from the story, or I should say the account of how Peter, for the second time in a row, miraculously escapes out of prison. The second half of this chapter is, it has to do with how, uh, where Peter goes from prison and the death of uh, the local leader there, the governor of the area, uh, Herod uh, Agrippa I, and, um, uh, and so on. So this morning, as we uh, kind of move away from uh, Peter's imprisonment, we're going to talk about where Peter goes from that. And I think there's some great lessons in here. There's some cool information about uh, uh, Bible characters, if we can put it that way, and there's just some great points in here of how we can, I think, walk with the Lord in a difficult time. So if you don't mind, uh, look over at verse 12, Acts 12, verse 12, and it says there, and we'll start here, when he realized this, that is Peter, he went into the house of Mary. So he's just gotten out of the jail, he's realized, okay, I actually was freed, it wasn't just a vision or a dream. And so now he's responding to this reality. When he realized this, he went into the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose name was Mark, and where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And recognizing Peter's voice uh, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hands to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said to them, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. And we'll stop there. The goal will be to, be to do both halves of the chapter, but we're going to first camp in Peter's return to his friends. And one of the things that is actually a common theme in the book of Acts, and I think very important, is that all the time you see Christians going back to their friends. The first time he gets delivered from prison, uh, what happens? They go to the friends. They go to the church, as it were, the, the home church, and they pray with them. Over and over again, you see people... Uh, when they, whether it's trial, whether it's Acts chapter 2, where it's just people are getting saved. But one of the major themes of Acts is that people spent time together. And we'll talk about that because we live in a kind of a weird time right now where that's more difficult and there's all sorts of conflicting information uh, regarding medical things and so forth. But as, you, as we kind of look through this portion, maybe keep that in the back of your mind. So first and foremost, he leaves and he goes to Mary, the mother of John Mark. Now, you might recall John Mark, he comes into play, actually, the next chapter. Uh, he kind of becomes a, uh, he's basically a caddy in the beginning uh, for uh, Paul and Barnabas. They go on a journey and they're like, hey, we need someone to carry our bags and to go with us to support us in this. And so they bring John Mark. Now, we know, or maybe you're familiar with, in Acts, John Mark actually leaves them. Things get a little hot, the persecution gets a little bit difficult, and John Mark splits ways and takes off. And that's actually the catalyst. John Mark becomes what, or I should say the fulcrum, that split Paul and Barnabas. Because in a few chapters, uh, 15 I think it is, they have an argument, and it's over John Mark. And Paul says, hey, we can't bring John Mark with us. He, he ditched out on us on the journey. We can't trust him. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and maybe because John Mark is his nephew, Barnabas says, no, let's bring John Mark. And it says that the, the conflict got so hot, literally hot, that they split ways. And so Paul grabs Silas, and he goes on a journey, and then Barnabas grabs uh, John Mark, and they go on a missionary journey. And for, our, uh, for us, the book of Acts continues to follow Paul uh, as, as the writer of the bulk of the New Testament letters and so forth. But anyway... All that to say is, that's this John Mark. That's who's here. Now, it's John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, and most believe that it's through his interaction with Peter that he received a lot of the information 
uh, that he was able to write the gospel with. Just as Luke, in the beginning of his gospel, he says, hey, I went around, I interviewed, I asked questions, I verified all this, and now I'm writing this to you, Theophilus, so you can know what Jesus began to do and to teach, right? So also with Mark, he wrote a gospel, and he did a similar thing, but the bulk of it was through Peter, the information that he wrote about. Uh, that being said, it's noteworthy that his mother is, is apparently, and this is kind of the cool things, I don't know if you're into this, but the, the details of Scripture can kind of give us a neat picture of what's going on. So uh, John Mark's mom, Mary, is most likely single. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been Mary's house in that culture. Does that make sense? It would have been the husband's house. So she's obviously, too, she's a woman of means. Because you'll notice there's a few things. Number one, she has a servant named Rhoda. Right? That was not common. Most, uh, she has a house that's big enough. It says that many were there praying. So she has a big house. Her house has a gate. That was also very uncommon to the, to the, the average person. The average person's house was a box and, and maybe a room, a second room for the animals at night or uh, during storms and so forth. So she lives in a, a big house. It's a gated community, as it were. She is a woman of means. Most, uh, a lot of scholars believe that it's Mary, uh, the mother of John Mark, that owned the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus goes and prays often. Uh, it was noteworthy that, for example, when Judas betrays him, he knew exactly where he would be, uh, that this was a normal retreat for Jesus. And that's, that's just, that last part is just people trying to put things together. Nobody knows for sure who owned that garden. But the point uh, that I want to make here is that here's a lady and she is, has a lot to lose, right? Who, did she, who is she about to receive into her house? Somebody with a death sentence. Remember, King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, wants to kill Peter. And so Peter, it's pretty cool, he knows, I just got out of, secretly got out of prison, I'm a wanted man, they want to kill me, I know where I can go. I can go to Mary's house. I'm going to find shelter at Mary's house. And I think it's noteworthy that here's a person, a person of great means, that's willing to risk it all and harbors a fugitive and harbors Peter. Not yet. He can't even get the door yet. But you see what I'm saying. And what a, what a great, and one of the things I want to talk about a lot, we, we mentioned the fact that people need to be together. We're designed to be together as Christians. That the example of the book of Acts is not isolation, but it's fellowship. The example of growth in people's lives is fellowship. The fact that here's a woman of great means that could lose it all, including her life. It would be nothing. It would be nothing to Herod if he were to find out where Peter went to go to her house and just take it. Yes, the Romans had courts, but it was not that good. There was no constitution like that. She, was pre- she, she, she could have lost John Mark. She could have lost her servants. It was, it was not rare for an entire family to just become anathema, to be, you know, I, uh, not isolated, but booted out of Rome. It wasn't rare for multiple people to be slain. It wasn't rare to be mistreated. It wasn't rare to be tortured. So here's this lady who has everything to gain and everything to lose, and she decides to risk it, to have fellowship. And really, the, what I kind of want to focus on in this part is the idea that right now we live in a dark time like they did, right? I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to make a comparison which was worse, and which, that's, that's not the issue. But we live in a really weird time, don't we? And I think what, what makes it weird is not just that there's different political ideals, and I've, I've talked about that. Not that there's different political ideas. I, honestly, I don't care about politics that much, um, not that I'm saying you shouldn't. I'm not trying to make any statements about it. I'm just saying that it's not really my cup of tea. But aside from the fact that we have differing politics, aside from the fact that even uh, you know in the, in the pandemic, we have different ideas about the pandemic and all those ranges, because of the division that's taken place and because of the, uh, the, the lack of justice, and again, I don't want to get into a debate over rioting versus protesting. That's not my deal. But I th- I'm hoping that most of us can agree that when you start pulling people out of their cars that are driving by, that that's bad. Hopefully we can, we can get on board with that, right? That when, we, when, you start, when you start to assault people and burn their stuff down, that that's, 
maybe gone too far. And if, if you can't agree with that, that's fine. We can talk about that afterwards, about executing violence and so forth. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that all this craziness and weirdness and division, and we can't even talk about it. And the same divisions, they happen in, in Christianity, unfortunately, too. Are there gifts or are there not gifts? Are there drums in worship or they're not drums in worship? Are we predestined or do we have choice? Or is it somewhere in the middle? Can you speak in tongues? Can you not speak in tongues? You know, all this, and, 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 and as our society persists in all these ways, the forms of, of conversation that we have now and the forms of comfort that we have to each other, they, they seem to be diminishing in quality. Does that make sense? And so what happens to us as the church is, is all day long, right? We're here for, for maybe an hour and a half, a week, but all the rest of the hours of the week, besides devotionals, and I'm not here to measure what your life is like, that's not my point, we work and we shop and we read and we interact with this world, right? And one of the things that seems to have really crept into the church, unfortunately, and I'm not saying our church, I mean, it's in general, is this isolation. And then the isolation that gives birth to poor reason and inability to dialogue. Does that make sense? And so because we be, our, our, our society has begun to train us that offense is the, fence, is the best defense mechanism or that offense is how I will preserve myself and my life, we begin to degrade as human beings and as a church and not function in the way we can. So we have this really amazing picture that John Mark's mom, Mary, lays out for us. A woman of means, and a woman who cares, she's ministered. This is, we know that this is right around 44 AD. The reason we know that, so you can do the math as far as when Jesus is crucified and so forth. The reason we know that is because Herod, the second half of this chapter, was slain in 44 AD. We know that because jo Flavius Josephus wrote about it. And if we, we get to that section, we'll, we'll talk about that. So we're, we're years, a decade and a half or so, into this work. And here she is. She was one of the women that supported Jesus in his ministry for three and a half years. And now she's supporting his work now. And Peter knew where he could go. And that's what people need. They need to know where they can go. They need to know where they can show up. They need to know where they're going to be welcome. They need to know where they're going to be safe. They need to know where they're where going to go where, and, and not be berated. They need that. And this woman facilitated that. And the question is, are we facilitating that in our own lives? We may not have a gated community and a fancy house and everybody can be there and all that, but are we facilitating a welcome mat to each other? Or are we kind of succumbing to this isolation? Isolation is crazy. Have you ever noticed that? It fills you with all sorts of weird delusions. Paranoia. Let's just be honest. Anybody here felt paranoia lately? Meaning like an unreasonable fear of your surroundings? Isn't that what every news network on the planet peddles right now? Right? If Trump gets in, then we're all going to be racist and hate everyone. If Biden gets in, then all our guns are gone and our country's going to hell. Right? Those are, the kind of, th those are the two narratives that we have to choose from. And they're both probably wrong. So we have, as Christians, a life and an opportunity to absolutely ignore those options. Because our life and our opportunity has nothing to do with our circumstances. Let's go on. Keep those thoughts, but let's go on. You have to love the humor of this story. So what happens is, Peter gets out, he shows up, he knocks on the door, Rhoda, the servant, she goes to open the door, and somehow it says she, she recognized his voice. So evidently they had some sort of dialogue through the door, and her response is to not open the door, which is probably part of the humor. And so she runs back to everybody in the prayer meeting, and she says, you'll never guess, Peter's at the door. And their response, these first century church of faithfulness in prayer is, you're crazy. Right? The beginning of the chapter told us exactly what they're praying for. They're praying that Peter will get released. That is the focus of their prayer meeting. And so here what happens is, 
Herod is oppressing. They're praying. This house is opened up. Miraculous things are happening. Peter gets released. She comes in. Rhoda comes in to say, guys, God has answered our prayer. And the response is like, you're an idiot. You're crazy. You're out of your dang mind. There's no way that God has answered our prayer and Peter's here. And then she says, no, she's insistent. No, he's there. You feel like, why didn't you just bring him in? I feel like that would have been a lot easier. But she goes, no, he's there. He's right there. And, they go, then, and this is their response, and this is even better. No, clearly it's his angel. Because clearly we all have individual angels, and they look and sound like us. What a bizarre conclusion. Every other angel you ever see in the Bible, like people fall down and die, right? John in Revelation sees an angel and it says he falls down as dead. In the Old Testament, an angel arrives and people are like, ah, you know, whatever it's, they, they like die or almost die. But in this case, their conclusion is, well, clearly it's just Peter's angel and he's lying about his identity and pretending to be him. For whatever reason, that would be profitable. We don't know. But clearly, this must be what's going on. Because it definitely could not be that God is answering our prayers. That is the one thing it couldn't be. Either you're crazy, or we have this new theory about how angels work. One of those two things, but definitely not that God is working in a tough situation. That cannot be the conclusion. And that's, it's, it's funny, because it's us, right? That's why it's funny. That's how we roll. We like kind of get in these modes, and we can look at like... We can look at everything that's going on right now. And instead of responding in faith, instead of responding and saying, God is able, instead of responding and saying, yeah, I don't know how this can work out, but I know the Lord is mighty, we instead retreat and say, anything can happen except that God works miraculously. That one is out. And because of that, our lives, instead of being above and living above our circumstances, Our lives and our moods and our attitudes become slaves to our circumstances. See, as soon as we remove the power of prayer and the power of God from our lives, all of a sudden, all we have are circumstances. All we have is to rock the vote. All we have is to petition. All we have is who's in Congress. All we have are bills that we can pass. that's, That's it. That's all we have. You know why the world is so scared of the election? Because it's all they have. That's it. But here's the thing. Isolation plays tricks on us. It brings us to places where we think God's not working, or he can't work, or this or that is going to crush me, or I can't get beyond that, or I don't know about this. And because we don't have fellowship to bounce it off. That's the great thing about fellowship is we come and we say stupid things, and someone says, that's stupid. God is really mighty. And we go, oh yeah, I forgot. Just like these people, here they are, interceding, praying for Peter. Hey, Peter's here. No, man. As if God answers prayer. Let's be real here. Clearly it's an angel. See, it's weird how we can get in these modes where we lose our faith in the reality of who God is and what he's done for us, his amazing grace. And we get into these modes, and then all of a sudden, the only thing we can see is what's going on the earth. And then we respond to that because it's the only thing that we have. But see, you and I, in, in this pandemic, in this political weirdness, in the, the, the anarchy, in all the things that we see going on, you and I are untouchable and unfazed because we have the Lord. See, our business and what we're doing on the earth, it's weird. It's hard to remember, but it has nothing to do with the earth in so much as what, what will dictate what we do and how we walk. See, we, we're heavenly citizens. We're, we're, our rules, our life, our importance is not this world. Now, here's the thing. Am I saying don't vote, don't, don't do it? No, of course I'm not saying that. You need to do what God has called you to do. We live in a society right now that has voting. And we get to help decide, I guess, 
how the presidency works. I mean, depending on who you talk to and how much you believe the Illuminati and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the, like, even that, you're like, does voting really work? Oh, does mailing the voting work? Does it not work? Is there, ha, ha, right? It can be like this. It's crazy. There is literally no security in our governmental system. Like, none. And we're just starting to see that. And it's just bizarre because you have propaganda from both sides just trying to push you in this thing. And again, I, I like being in America. I like it. I like having my own land. I like the fact that we get to meet and we can say what we want from the Bible. I, I, I cherish those rights. So I'm not demeaning the rights. I'm not making light of the rights. I'm not making light of the system that was introduced for America because in my opinion, so far it's the best dang system it's ever been, but it's secondary because it's not what makes up my life or how I live it, or at least it shouldn't be. And so we as Christians have this amazing reality to be part of, and it's praying and seeing God do great, thing, great things. Right now in our weirdness is not the time to draw back. It's not the time, and I'm not making a comment about social distancing or coming to church per se or something like that. I'm just saying that because of the weirdness and the iniquity, remember Jesus even said, in the end times, because iniquity will abound, right? Iniquity, it's the idea, uh, the Old Testament word is, is, uh, has to do with crooked, being crooked or perverted. Because perversion will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And you can see that begin to happen. Have you noticed that in your own life? Where it just seems so overwhelming. It seems so crazy. It seems so insurmountable. You go, what's even the point? What's the point of going to church? Do people still get saved? Do visitors still come out? What am I doing in all of this? And, and because the iniquity bounds, and because of the isolation, and because of the weirdness, we can begin to draw back. And to say, well, I'm just going to hunker down now. I'm going to get in my house. I'm going to buy gold and guns. You know, whatever I'm going to do, right, to, to, to preserve my life. And we, and we look inward. Because we neglect the fact that in one night, through the, par- the prayers of the saints, God single-handedly thwarts the most powerful man in the Mediterranean, unless Caesar shows up. This guy's personal plot is to kill Peter. And God shows up and thwarts this ruler's plot like it's nothing. Just walks right out the front door like it's nothing. And he's still doing that. So God hasn't changed. It's not that like it's somehow in 2020, like prayer's kind of gotten a little weaker, like it was super powerful in the first century, and now it's kind of dwindled down to like occasionally you find your keys or something miraculously. <laughs> right? But the fact that it's, it's still working, it's still moving, He's still powerful. He hasn't dwindled. It doesn't matter how dark the days get. It doesn't dim the light. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be those that are pressing forward in that and not retracting right now. This isn't like a word of rebuke or anything. It's a word of encouragement that we have great things in store for us. And nothing that's going on in this world changes that. It may change how the great things happen. It may change how we interact some, in some ways, but it doesn't change anything. But you and I and what we're involved in is borderline in spite of what this world is doing. Right? We, we get to do whatever God calls us to do with all the power in the world. And we're not limited in any way because it's the Lord. And really it boils down for us to say, Lord, what do you, what do you want us to do? How do you want me in my personal life? What is it that you have for me? Where, where is it that you want me to go? That's really what it boils down to. We're looking at another side of things. So we kind of looked at their side and learning to trust in prayer. And so she eventually, Rhoda goes back and she lets him in. But one of the things I, I, I found interesting is how does Peter feel? You're a wanted criminal with a death sentence. You knock on this door where you feel like this door should just be open to me. I'm stinking Peter. I'm out of prison. I'm knocking on a door. Why doesn't she just open this door? You know, they don't have glass, right? Like, glass was for, like, the lavishly rich. So there's no glass windows in Galilee. 
That, that was, there, there was probably glass windows uh, on, on Herod's temple, but as far as like people having glass, they had holes, right? And like wood shutters, that's what they had. So I wondered, and I, there's no thing to say he did or didn't. I wonder if Peter heard the argument. Like, come on, guys. I'm right here. I knocked. She responded. She heard my voice. And I think just a lot of times, like when we're in Peter's spot, we go where we feel we should be accepted or we, something should happen. The door should open right away, and we stop knocking. And we just go, whatever. You didn't receive me the way you should have. In this case, in verse 16, it says that Peter kept knocking. This is really important in isolation and in just in Christian life. It's kind of a, a thing right now in, in Christianity where we're not dialoguing, we're not talking, we're not working things out. And so we knock at a door we feel should open, and it doesn't open right away, so we just stop knocking. Or we have a, a division in the relationship somehow. And it doesn't matter if it's in a personal relationship, in a church relationship, or a work relationship. Our whole societal dynamic right now, and it's infiltrating the church too. I don't say that like mean, like, yeah, you're, yeah. I'm just saying like, this is kind of where we live right now. And, and I talk about this a lot, so forgive me for that, but I think it's important because we've got to contradict this in our own thinking, in our own reason as, as Christians. And that is this. Our whole society supports one another when we just rage and have negative ideas. Have you noticed that? That's how social media works. Something happens to me. I went to John Mark's mom's house, Mary. I knocked on the door. The stinking servant didn't open it. So what do I do? I you know, bust out my Galilean iPhone, and I make a post that I went to John Mark's mom's house, Mary, and she didn't let me in right away. In fact, they had to have this big argument, and they're so stupid because they think I was an angel. What kind of morons are these people? And then we post it. And we know that our friends are going to come along, and they're going to go, yeah, yeah, John Mark's mom is a kind of garbage just because she helped Jesus for three and a half years and facilitates the whole church, but she didn't let you in. You're right. She's trash. Maybe I can get like 150 likes on the fact that John's, John Mark's mom is trash. Right? Because that's what our friends do. Because they want to support us. So they jump on there and they go, yeah. And in private conversation, I go, I went to this person and they said this to me and they're trash. And so we go, yeah, they are. They are trash. That's good. Yes, I agree with this. And if they don't say that to us, what do we say? You're not my friend. I said this person's trash. You don't agree with me. Clearly, we're not friends. It's like reason and dialogue are completely gone. You know, it's funny because the Proverbs say that the, that the, uh, the, kiss, or the, the beatings, the smitings of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. It's a good friend that comes along and says, well, maybe Mary's not trash. She was just in the other room. Maybe they were trying to work through something on the inside, work through some of their unbelief, and then they came and they let you in, Peter. Maybe they're not trash people. Maybe they just don't have everything together, like us. See, I talk about this so much because I, I think anybody who's on social media understands what I'm saying. Or anybody who watches any news outlet knows what I'm saying. Our society revolves around trash talking. I mean, how many, how many sermons can you watch where someone is there just trash-talking some other pastor or some other ministry or, or some, some big-name person that, that honestly is just too big for them and is never going to even consider who they are? And they just trash-talk because they just feel they have the right to just trash-talk. It's so weird. So what that trash-talking does, the reason that's so it's so... Um, destructive for us and for the church, for the kingdom of God, is because when we trash talk people, when we trash talk one another, when we're, never, we're not really willing to keep knocking, in other words, we're not willing to give an, an opportunity for reconciliation, then we separate. And it's crazy because what did Jesus say there in John 13? What did Jesus say how every single person on the planet would know that we're Christians? Because we fly a dove? Because we're part of a Baptist convention? Because we're on YouTube? Because we have big Bibles? Because 
we love one another. Right? He said, this is how everybody's going to know that you're a disciple of mine, meaning you're following my way. You love people. You treat people well. You give people opportunity. He says, if you actually want people to understand that you're a follower of Jesus, it's not about the fish on the back of our cars. It's about loving people around us. And you have to, you have to appreciate the fact that Peter just keeps knocking. Because he could have been like, you know what? I'm going somewhere else. I'm done. I knocked. You guys had some sort of weird conversation. It didn't cater to what I wanted. And now I'm out. And that's what we do with friendships. It's what we do with relationships all the time. And, and isolation makes it worse. Have you noticed that? Because now we don't have to see the people we're treating poorly. Now we can just text them. We can text whatever we want and then block someone. I don't know if there's a more cowardly act than that, but we can do that. You're trash and this is why. Boop, block. Ha, 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 ha. Vengeance is mine. You're like, really? I feel like childishness is yours, but okay. But that's how we roll as a society. And we want to come back from that as Christians. We don't want to isolate. We don't want to let this world's uh, circumstances dictate what we do. We don't want to let this world's fears dictate what we do. We want to rise above it. And if that's what, we do that through the power of the Spirit. We do that through being real with one another, being real with God, and interacting. And that's what's going to bring power to a church and a location, power to a family, power to a ministry, power to your personal witness at work, is being a reasonable, per a reasonable person that trusts prayer and that God is real, that he's not done regardless of any circumstance, that is willing to give opportunity to others to interact with and to forgive and, and to be able to essentially hear and to move on. That's where the life of power is. The life of power isn't in retraction and rejection. It's in boldness and invitation. And it's a completely different life. There's a, a great uh, couple of verses. We don't have time for all of them because I do want to look at uh, the death of our, our buddy here. Herod. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll just jump right to it. Verse 14, he says this, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. See, I don't know about you, but the crazy thing about isolation is it kind of, for me, it makes me forget about the basics of Jesus. Don't return evil for evil. Think about that. Don't return evil for evil. If we didn't return evil for evil, I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be an internet. I think it would be gone because there'd be no, nothing on it. If we didn't return evil for evil... Think about relationships and how amazing they would be. Just our friendships. So often, you know, we can have that irkness in our, in our soul and our spirit about something, and we refer to somebody that way. In fact, he even addresses that. He says, be patient with everyone, with all. Be patient, right? Patient is steadfast. It's endurance. It's staying with someone. And we know the difference between patient words and unpatient words, right? You ever been really frustrated with your kid? Kids are easy to be impatient with because they can't do squat about it. You ever notice that? Right? It's easier to be impatient with people that you know can't do anything back to you. A clerk at a store, your own kid, you know, whoever it might be. That's why, you know, bullying and whatnot. But it's easy to be impatient. You know, your, your kid is doing something you don't like. You know that there's nothing they can do about your impatience. So you can, whatever, grab them by the arm. You knock that off. Right? Because frustration has risen. We're embarrassed in the store. Whatever brings it all about. But we can do that in an impatient way. But we're called to be patient towards all. You ever had somebody in your life that just annoyed you like crazy? Always maybe kept bringing up the same things or always, you know, whatever it might be, just ways that, that we get annoyed and we can finally be like, just stop it! Usually we're, we have too much self-control for that, so we're just like, can you just relax a little bit, please? But it's the same heart. But see, we're to be patient with all. We're to keep knocking, like Peter. We're to keep going out. We're to accept the fact that, yes, for whatever reason, this church 
has to have a discussion of whether or not it's Peter or an angel. When I'm outside in the middle of the street as a wanted criminal, right? Patience. Kindness. And he says, always ready to do good. See, as Christians, these are our callings to everyone. Always patient. Always ready to do good. To to walk into the church front doors and say, today I'm here to do good to everyone. Yes, I'm hoping to get something out of the Word. Yes, I want to worship God. Absolutely, those are, those are good aspirations. But realistically, it's not called a church service because it's serving you. It's a church service because we're serving Christ. And so to be able to, and it's amazing, in the, the depths of difficulty in our souls, the change of attitude from isolation and, and me... Instead, to say, you, Lord, and you're what you want, what that does to the human psyche is nothing short of miraculous. To be able to walk in and literally deny myself and say, I'm here for you, Jesus. It, it changes the entire dynamic of any place. When you walk into a dinner party, when you walk into work, when you walk into church, when you walk into school, when you walk into someone's office, when you, whatever it might be, to walk in and say, I'm here to make sure that I can always do good to everyone. And that's my motivation. And again, you know, honestly, this is for me. It's for me. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately in, in just my own life and to, to, to get my head on straight and to say, you know what? This is not the time where I retract and I sit in my house and I bemoan COVID rules or something like that or worry about when the Bible will get outlawed because that's coming, my friends. It's coming. I mean, there's already laws in the books. Like, for example, in California, you can't even often offer certain types of therapy if it has to do with sexuality. I mean, it's coming. We're, we're not far from being illegal. And that's fine. We'll just meet in homes. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally not a big deal. Because we'll just keep serving Jesus, and we'll just keep talking about the Bible, and he'll just keep doing miracles. So, you know, the C.S. Lewis said, the life of societies and cultures are to us as the life of a gnat. Because our life is heavenly, and it just transcends every single thing that's on this earth. You cannot be stopped as a believer in Jesus Christ. They can put you in chains and you can pray. They can tape your mouth shut and you can pray. Right? They can take your head and you're going to be with Jesus. So we don't have to retract in all the weirdness and the political. We don't have to fear. We have, it, it doesn't even apply to us because God is doing great things and he's doing it on, on behalf of you and he's doing it through you. And it just boils down to us saying, okay, Am I going to be part of this, or am I not going to be part of this? But it's this very simple exchange life. Not what I want, Lord, but what you want. And it's manifested that way. Acts chapter 12. Do you guys ever get those little foldy pages on your Bible? I have to take care of it right then. For some reason, it just really bothers me. Acts chapter 12. So there in verse 20, he said, oh, I'm sorry, verse 18. Now, when the day came, when day came, so that was that night, the next day, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. I bet not. They were chained to him. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries, which means he tortured them and asked questions, and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So Herod's response was... Um, a fairly normal Roman response. We talked about this before. If you were in the Roman legion and you, were in, you had some sort of responsibility uh, pertaining to prisoners, if your prisoner escaped, you received the penalty that that prisoner would have got. So if it was a flogging, you got flogged. If it was a death sentence, you got slain. If it was a fine, you got fined. Uh, so that's why, obviously, they wake up in the morning, Peter's not there. They know exactly what's going to happen to them. Uh, so 
it's one of those things. It's a, it's a, you kind of have to ask the question. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time of it on it. Excuse me. You know, why did God let this happen to them? Well, they've reaped, they reaped what they sowed. And perhaps in those fearful moments, knowing exactly where they were going and what was going to happen to them, they could have called out to the God of Peter. We have no idea what this difficulty brought about in their life. Verse 20, now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So this is, there's a historical context for this. For time's sake, it is interesting. I'm not going to go all into it. Uh, it's nothing that you can't figure out with like, you know, five minutes and Google. It says there, and they came to him with one accord. So this is these nations that were uh, dependent on uh, Galilee for grain. It says, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, uh, most likely that means they bribed him, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes and took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them, and the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. So I actually printed out, this is um, a printout from uh, the the works of Josephus, so the second volume, the 334th section. And so this is Josephus' account of how Agrippa died. It says, now when Agrippa had reigned three years over all Judea, he came to the city Caesarea, which was formerly called Stratus Tower. And there he exhibited shows in honor of Caesar, upon his being informed that there was a certain festival celebrated to make vows for his safety, at which festival a great multitude was gotten together of the principal persons and such, were, uh, and such as were of dignity throughout his province. So there's this, he's having a... a Basically, there's a festival where everybody makes vows that they're going to keep him safe. And the people that are showing up are the rich and the influential of the area, okay? Um, kind of cocky. Verse, uh, not verse, but section 344. On the second day of which shows, he put on a garment made wholly of silver and a contexture truly wonderful and came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh uh, reflection of the sun's rays upon it, shone out after a surprising manner, and was so resplendent as to spread a horror over those who looked intently on him. So in other words, if, if the language is a little weird, it's the, the next morning he gets up, he's wearing like a, basically like a silver um, plate mail type of shirt with little discs that are they're polished all over it. So he goes into this theater where they're all there to adore him and to say, we're going to keep you safe. And when he sits down, the light hits it and it reflects out. And so the people's response were, like, this is supernatural. It was a horror to them. It was so brilliant from the reflection of the sun that the people viewed it as something that was almost beyond earthly possible. Okay? And it says there, and presently his flatterers cried out from one Uh, one from one place and another from another, though not for his good, that he was a god. And they added, Be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. So they see this and they say, You're not a man, you're a god. We thought you were just a man, but we were wrong. You're a god. It says, Upon this, the king did neither rebuke them, nor reject their impious flattery. So he accepted it. But as he presently afterwards looked up, he saw an owl sitting on a certain rope over his head and immediately understood that this bird was the messenger of ill tidings, as it had once been the messenger of good tidings to him, and fell into the deepest sorrow. So he had some sort of revelation. We don't know. I mean, it's just this was given to Josephus. Uh, either from one of his servants, but he has some sort of revelation where he's there, they're adoring him, his, his outfit's shining from the silver, and then he looks up and he sees this owl, and whether it was a sign from God or a Satan or whatever it was, he realizes something very bad is about to happen. This, this owl has been here before and it brought me good tidings, but for some reason he says, this owl is now going to bring me bad tidings. And he says there... Um, well, it says, as it, has, as it has once been a messenger of good tidings to him, and fell into the deepest sorrow, a severe pain also arose in his belly, and began in a most violent manner. 
He therefore looked upon his friends and said, so this is Herod Agrippa saying to the crowd, I, whom you call a god, am commanded presently to depart this life. While providence thus reproves the lying words you just now said to me, and I, who was called by you immortal, am immediately to be hurried away by death. So you understand what's happened? He sees the owl, he realizes that he has accepted this worship, and he essentially his gut starts to hurt really bad, and he then announces back to them, your lying words that I accepted have cost me my life. I'm going to die now. He says, but I am bound to accept of what providence allots as it pleases God, for we have no means lived ill, but in a splendid and happy manner. And when he said this, his pain was become violent. Accordingly, he was carried into the palace, and the rumor went abroad everywhere that he would certainly die in a little time. But the multitude sat in sackcloth with their wives and children after the law of their country and besought God for the king's recovery. All places were also full of mourning and lamentation, and the king rested in a high chamber, and as he saw them below lying prostrate on the ground, he could not himself forbear weeping. So he sees all these people, and he begins to cry. And when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life, being in the, 30, the 44, excuse me, 54th year of his age and in the seventh year of his reign. So you can see that history also uh, collaborates this account. Now the one thing that's interesting is it says that he, the angel smote him, he was eaten with worms, and he died. And it kind of gives the implication like he's sitting on this throne, and then all of a sudden he gets worshipped, and then all these worms come out from everywhere and like chomp on him and he dies, which would be rather grody. Um, so why does it say that? Most likely because it's a very Jewish way of relating that someone is dead. And you can actually go through the Old Testament and, uh, and see in and, and, and other Jewish literature where the term eaten by worms means he died, which is just a very colorful way. You might recall there's, like for example, when David goes and slays all these guys, he makes this announcement, we're going to go kill everyone that pees against the wall, right? Kind of funny for our culture, but that's just, they just had color, colorful colloquialisms to say, in that case, we're going to go kill all the men. Right? So in this case, it's, he was eaten by worms. So it's noteworthy that the angel strikes him, the pain begins, but he doesn't die for five more days. And then he's buried and he's eaten by worms. So it's not that the scripture is somehow inaccurate or it's wrong. It's that it was written at a time with certain colloquialism, certain phraseologies. Like, you know, we, we use the phrase, uh, I don't know, nothing comes to mind right now. But, you know, we have all sorts of phrases that are, you know, that aren't, that aren't true, um, you know, and we exaggerate, you know, we use phrases like, I'm, as, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. If you wrote that into a letter to someone, if I was writing to my wife, and I was like, I'm so hungry I can eat a horse, and 2,000 years from now, somebody picks it up and goes, wow, they ate horses back then, <laughs> right? It would be inaccurate. I'm just so hungry I could eat a horse. You guys know what I'm saying, because you're from my time in my era, right? This is all that's being said. The angel smote him. He died, and he was eaten of worms. That's, that's what's being said here. So we don't have to be worried about it. It's also noteworthy that evidently, because Herod was an avid, uh, outwardly an avid Jew, he was a Hellenistic Jew, he believed and he wanted to please the Jewish people. So when he's talking about God, he's talking about the Jewish God, even though he had rejected Christianity, it was in fact persecuting Christianity. It could be that these five days in radical pain could be what he maybe Herod is in heaven. I'm not saying he is, but sometimes the most gruesome and difficult things of our life are what can bring the most fruit. Have you ever noticed that? And so this, this five days that Herod gets right here, this is five days to repent. This is five days to think about the fact, well, two days ago I accepted some worship and now I'm dying. <laughs> Well, three days ago, I accepted some worship, and I've kind of lived kind of pompously. I mean, I did kill that guy James and hundreds of others, not to mention forced all sorts of slavery and all that kind of thing. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. It's amazing what pain will do in our lives. Have you noticed that? And, and physical pain, emotional pain, but physical pain too. Haven't you ever like been sick for a few days, and you're like, I'll do anything. What have I done? It can get weird sometimes too, like... I'm sick for two days now. Clearly, I must have sinned. You're like, no, we're not health wealthers. I didn't sin. I'm just sick. It's kind of how life goes, right? 
But pain can give all sorts of things in our lives. And so here Herod gets five days to repent, five days to acknowledge, I brought this upon myself. Have mercy on me, God. And so then, and then he goes and he dies. So then the last question that we're asked about this before we move on. Why is God's glory so important to him? Is he an egomaniac? Is God like, because there's, mul- there's all sorts of verses, huh? There's, there's multiple verses which says, I am the Lord and my glory I will not share with another, right? Through the Old Testament, the, we always have anybody who ever like went in and messed mess with God's glory or the ark or anything was killed. I mean, remember the guy who reaches up just to stop the ark from falling off a cart? I can't remember his name. Oh, oh no. I can't remember his name. Huzzah? Bless you. He, you know, the, the, it falls off. And he's like, oh, no, the ark is falling. That seems pretty legit, right? The ark is falling off the cart. I should stop this. And he kills him. And David, who at the time was dancing around in his underwear around the, the cart, super excited about the fact that they were bringing him home, he, like, stops dancing. He's like, ah, oh, why did you do that, God? And he gets all upset and real mad, like, kind of goes all pouty, right? And so why? Why is it that God says, look, you have to do things my way. And when you don't do things my way, bad things happen. Why is it that God says, hey, here's the deal. You have to give me the glory. Is he like really self-conscious? Does he need like affirmation? Is that his love language? I mean, like what, what is going on here? And it's this. When we take glory from God, anybody, when anybody takes glory from God, it minimizes to others who he is. And the only thing that we have going for us as humans is who he is. So when you minimize to someone else, when Herod stands up and says, yes, I am powerful because my slaves can polish silver. You should follow me. You should bow down to me. It's destructive, right? Because if you begin to follow him and you begin to trust him, and you begin to think that Herod has something going for him, he dies. And then where does that leave you? Any time that we tarnish who God is, whether it's by sin or by usurping his glory, how can you usurp his glory? We can do it all sorts of ways. We can misuse spiritual gifts and then think ourselves. Maybe you're an amazing, you know, I don't know, something. Maybe you're an amazing at, at orchestrating things, at, at making things, sure things work. Maybe you can fix things. Maybe you're an amazing singer. Maybe you're amazing whatever, whatever you are that God's given you. And then you can use that, and then somebody says, hey, thanks. And you can kind of start to think to yourself, yeah, you're welcome. And then you can begin to kind of walk in that kind of attitude. And, and, and when you bring that kind of attitude to other people, there's kind of some options of what happened. Number one, when we take God's glory and we try to apply it to ourselves, because we like it when people compliment it. We like it if somebody wants to kind of follow us and admire us and think that we're actually all that. We like, what we do is we divert that person's eyes from God and we put them on ourselves, which is an absolute recipe for destruction, right? Because someday we're going to fail. We can literally shipwreck, shipwreck people's faith when we try to take God's glory to ourselves. I am, I am really great. Thanks for mentioning that. You're right, you're right. It's, it's just, I don't know how I keep doing it. I just, all the glory is to God because I'm so great. Right? They begin to trust us. There's nothing worse in the world than someone looking to you for salvation. It'll either crush you, it'll crush them, or it'll crush you both. It's always, the eyes always have to be the Lord's. Our, our, we always have to be pointing people to Jesus. If we say, hey, I'm doing this Bible study, come to this Bible study, it's because I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Not because I'm going to give you inner knowledge from me. Trust me, buy my book. If you don't have my book, you can't follow Jesus. If you haven't read my pamphlet on creation, then you are follow Jesus. It's all over the place. And the second thing that happens is that people realize, realize that you're full of trash, right? They see you, they see through this charade, they realize it, and then they, then they mock God, right? Don't tell me you haven't tuned into TBN before and been like, 
I'm not, I'm not making a cross the board statement of anybody on TBN. I'm just saying that we've all gotten letters in the mail, and if we plant the seed, then we're going to get a thousandfold back. You know, all that stuff, right? And so, and then and people, you have to come to my church, or you have to do this. And we look at that, and we, but the unbeliever, because we look at it, hopefully with discernment, and go, uh, I'm probably not going to plant the seed today. But you know what the unbeliever does? The unbeliever looks at it and they scoff. And they say, This is who God is? This is your God that you have to bake for money? You're trying to get rich? Trying to, trying to get glory for yourself? This is the second thing that usually happens. So either we bring somebody to ourselves and it ends up in destru- destruction for both of us, or the, the unbeliever sees it and God gets mocked for it. Or, or lastly, and, and this, is the, this is the kind of the, I think the exception and not the rule, someone lovingly realizes what you're doing and loves you through it and maybe approaches you and says, hey, God's kind of put this on my heart for you. I see you kind of like to, every time you touch a trash bag, you like look around. And I'm just concerned that maybe you're looking around to see if people are watching you empty the trash. This is a bad deal, man. You don't want to go down that road. Or I see that you're checking your Facebook posts to see how many likes you get all the time. Did everybody herald you as this social media? See, I have it easy because we get like two views a month. So I have it easy. But you see what I'm saying? Somebody might come along lovingly and, and correct us on it. That's the best case scenario. But the other two scenarios are way more often. So if you're wondering, why is God so protecting of his glory. And glory means literally good opinion or weightiness. So in other words, the good opinion gives a weight to God and who he is. And we don't want to make God light in a sense. We don't want to make him a lightweight. We don't want to draw from that because it'll just end up bad. So we don't, we don't ever want to take that glory. That's why he's so protective. He's protective of his glory because it only means good for us when he's glorified. And when the glory is, is try, attempted, usurped, then it only means bad for us and for those around us. That's the time we have. But I want to encourage you with this last verse, verse 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Amen? All the shenanigans, the political, the Herods, all the weirdness (laughs) that we see, all the isolation, the word of God increased. You know, the, the only thing, because Jesus told us in Luke 8, the only thing the word of God needs to be fruitful is fruitful hearts. That's all it needs. It just needs a heart that's willing to receive it. It can grow in the absolute worst areas of the world, the most arid deserts, and in the deepest oceans. It doesn't matter. It can grow anywhere as long as there's a willing heart. That's all it takes. So, I don't know about you, but it seems like the times we live in kind of suck. But I, want to, I think that God could still do something, like, amazing. I'm pretty sure. I mean, it seems to be his MO. So, I just encourage you this week. Number one, when you find yourself discouraged, pray about it. And that's, and that's not like some generic, like, oh, just pray about it. But, like, literally pour your heart out to the Lord. Cry out to him. Be honest about it. Get a friend involved, right? So James tells us in his letter that we confess our faults to one another, pray for one another, there's healing. Realize that when, when the news agencies and when the periodicals and all the media come creeping in and trying to isolate and discourage you, realize like they're nothing to you. The Oval Office means nothing to you because one day it's going to be crushed and you will live on in glory. It doesn't dictate to you what God is doing. It doesn't dictate to you your mood. All it does is dictate, you know, whatever, meet publicly or just stuff, just earthly stuff. That's all it does. So when you get discouraged about it, because it's easy to be discouraged about it, you know, vote your conscience too. That's great. But then realize that you don't have to worry about it. Because it's just, it's just below you. I don't say that like pompously. I just mean like the origin of your life is heaven. The power of your life is from heaven. And the earth can't taint that. Anyway. Let me, can I share one more verse? You can leave if you don't want to, but I'm going to share one more verse. I didn't mean that to be a jerk. I just mean like I know people got stuff to do, but this has kind of been nagging me since last night, and it has nothing to do with, with anything. 
I just was kind of drawn to this last night as I was laying in my bed. In Psalm 34, I'm not going to put on a white suit with a white vest and a white tie, but uh, I think, I think that this is for someone. But in Psalm 34, in verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So let's close with that. If you're brokenhearted today, you know what's the interesting thing? God doesn't break any hearts, does he? And he doesn't crush any spirits. So if we're brokenhearted, our spirit is crushed, it's usually because we did it to ourselves or someone did it to us. And so even if you've broken your own heart through your own foolishness or if someone's done or whatever it might be, just if you have a broken heart today, if your spirit is crushed, the Lord is near you. He's near you. And he cares about you. And he's working. So whoever that's for, God bless you. Um, God is not done. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness and your grace. Lord, thank you for just a building uh, to be out of the rain in. And Lord, thank you for all the exceeding blessings that we have. You're very kind to us. Thank you that you saved us and you have great things for us. Help us to be moving forward in all that you want for us. Help us to be those who see the value, experience the value, and treasure the value of your kingdom. Lord, help us in our, this weird time, this isolation, not to get bogged down with the iniquity and the division and just kind of the overall scariness of these realities. But instead, Lord, help us to excel and to grow and to be part of the solution. You're very, very good to us. And we appreciate it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys.